And so, hey, let's dive into this today. I'm so excited to talk to you about marriage and about relationships, about dating and intimacy and all those wonderful things that uh, you know God has laid out for us. And, and, uh, and I'm just so thankful, again, for the gift of marriage. How many of you know that marriage is a gift? And it is a gift from God that he gave us between a man and a woman. And I love the, the title of this series, Relation Slips, because how many of you have slipped? How many of you have made some mistakes in marriage? You don't have to be married very long before you realize, I don't know what I'm doing. You don't have to be a parent very long before you realize you don't know how to parent. Come on, am I right about that? We've all made mistakes. How many of you have made some mistakes already in your marriage at some point, right? You've made some mistakes in parenting. Anybody? Make, some of you have two hands and a foot in the air, right? We, we've all made some mistakes in that. And so we begin to realize more and more that we need the word of God. We need the wisdom of God. God's word is true to lean not to your own understanding, but in all that ways acknowledge him, acknowledge his wisdom, his leadership, and he shall direct your path. Because marriage is not a, a contract. Marriage is a covenant. It's about two becoming one. And when two become one, you don't become one like this. You become one like this, where you can't even see the other person. You literally become one. And there's all kinds of things about that person that you've got to get to know, that you've got to get to understand. I always tell people that, that dating advertises a product that marriage does not deliver. When you date a person, you don't even really date them. You, you date their, their agent. This is, this is their ambassador. This is a, the person representing them, right? And I never met my, my wife till, you know, I married her because I dated my girlfriend. And somewhere on that wedding night, wife Joanne killed girlfriend Joanne. I haven't seen her in years. And it was about, you know, a year later where we had uh, Alexander and then mom Joanne killed wife Joanne. I haven't seen any of them in 17 years and vice versa, right? But they're still down in there and we've got to get back to them. We've got to bring that out through love and affection and all those needs of meeting the needs of our spouse and, and really having a, a servant attitude and not a selfish attitude. We've really got to be servants one to another and prefer our spouse above ourselves. That's how you got in a marriage in the first place. You preferred that person above yourself. See, divorce happens when a relationship has gone bankrupt. When everybody starts making withdrawals and nobody makes deposits, that's what causes a relationship to go bankrupt. But how you got in that marriage, how you got in that relationship was deposits, 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 and investments, and investments, and investments. And I think it's so great to have a church like this that would take the time to put on a series like this to invest into our homes. Can somebody say amen if you believe that? I would also like to say to our dating, uh, our, our singles, that if you're here and, and you're, you're single, raise the value you place on yourself. Realize that you are somebody in Christ, and that single doesn't mean half a person. Single means whole. That you're a whole person looking for another whole person. Raise the value you place on you. See, if I ever got ready to buy um, your pastors or, or one of our, our, our friends uh, a, a nice suit or something, I would never go to Kmart. And I'm sure they're probably glad about it. It's, it's that they set a standard too high that intimidates me from giving anything to them that is less than how they treat themselves. So you set the stage. You tell us who you are by how you treat yourself. And so if you have an anything will do mentality, people will do you with anything. But if you set a standard, either they have to come up to your playing field or walk off and say she thinks she's so much and walk off and leave her alone. Because when I meet you, the reality is you should already be involved in a relationship with you. See, if you can't find a way to love you, how are you gonna find a way to love me? Don't get in relationships with people who, who can't find a way to love themselves. You're going to be pouring into a bucket with a hole. You're never going to be able to fill it. You look nice today. Didn't say anything about yesterday. We've got to plug that hole up, right? And so you've got to find a way to value you. Nobody can give you self-esteem. That's why it's called. Sometimes you just got to realize and learn how to celebrate yourself. That's one of the great things that you've got to learn in being single is learn how to celebrate yourself. It's part of your godlike nature to celebrate yourself. 
Even God did it when he was making the heavens and the earth. Before he created anybody to praise him or celebrate him, he celebrated himself. He said, you know what? Let there be light. And there was light. You know what? That's good. He separated the firmaments from those which were above the waters, from those which were beneath. He looked back and said, you know what? That is good. See, you got to learn how to celebrate yourself. You got to say, you know, I hadn't paid off all these credit cards, but I paid off one. And you know what? That's good. That's good. You know, I'm, I'm not finished with school, but I finished one semester. And you know what? That is good. And I hadn't lost 100 pounds, but I lost 10. And you know what? That is good. And learn how to celebrate. Don't celebrate with cheesecake. I tried that. Celebrate with something else. <laughs> celebrate with a salad. But you've got to learn how to celebrate yourself and raise the value that you place on you. You know, if, if you're here and, and you're married, learn how to heal with your words. L- l- realize that, that if words can wound, words can also heal. Amen. If, if one negative touch, one, one perverted touch, one molestation touch can hurt a person, then one touch from God can heal a person. One touch from the Holy Spirit can heal and make somebody whole. Come on, does anybody believe that today? See, we, we, we have to learn how to heal. You could literally heal your marriage today with words. Heal your husband with words. Heal your wife with words. Heal your children with words. Heal, heal, and heal. And if you want to know what God has called you to heal, look at what he's healed you of. Because when God heals you, he leaves the medicine inside of you to heal someone else. Whatever God's healed you of, he left that medicine in you. You're called to be a healer. See, pain makes you selfish. Pain makes you selfish. Anytime you go to the ER, no one's in there going, oh, I'm hurting. No, you go ahead. No, no, you. No, you. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'm bleeding. But you go. No, you. Everybody's like, hey, I was here first. Hey, what about me? How much longer do I have to wait? Because pain makes you selfish. And as long as you're in pain in your marriage, you're going to be a person that is focused on yourself. You're going to be a person that is making withdrawals and not making deposits because you're in pain. And so you've got to go to God and say, God, heal this in my life and allow God to heal. God will heal the wound, but he will not heal the scar. The scar is your testimony. See, we cover up scars. We put makeup on scars. We put clothes on top of scars because we don't want anybody to know what we went through. And you will forever and always feel victimized if you cover your scars. And you will not be able to reason why God lets you go through what you went through. Why did God let you go through a divorce? Why did God let you go through that adultery? Why did God let you grow up without a mother? Why did God let you go through a father? Why did God let you have to go through lack and all these kind of things? And you will forever feel victimized until you show somebody your scars. And when somebody sees what you went through and they said you made it, that means I I can make it. Now you move from being a victim to being a vessel and you turn misery into ministry and pain into praise. And the father healed Jesus's wounds, but he did not heal his scars. In fact, you will know Jesus by the nail prints in his hands. And if our savior is willing to be identified by his scars, maybe we should be willing to be identified by ours. Come on, am I helping anybody in here? And, and realize that I can heal. I will not be a person that speaks curses over my children, over my wife. I'm not going to speak cursing over my, my, my husband. I had to get on to people. They were frustrated at our church because some of the kids were cursing in kids' ministry. I said, they curse in kids' ministry because they're cursed at. We cannot bring cursing into our home. Cursing is Satan's language. I'm not going to tear down my children and my own home. I, will, I refuse to be Satan's evangelist in my house. I refuse to be Satan's pastor in my own home because bitterness and hate is how you make Satan your pastor. Oh, Jesus. And when you say, I'm going to allow the healing words, I'm going to prophesy over my marriage, I'm going to prophesy over my children. Do you know most of us have grown up without a prophetic word from our parents? Most adults have grown up, there's, they've never received one prophetic word from their parents. 
Every Father's Day, I give all of my children and my wife a prophetic word, and I, I give them gifts. I, I, I prophesy over them because, you know, our kids go to school, and they hear demonic prophecies spoken over them all the time. Most godly prophecies are so long, people can't remember it. But most demonic prophecies are so short, they remember it because it's typically one word. If you were ever bullied, it was one word spoken over you again and again and again. You're stupid. You're dumb. You're ugly. You're a loser. You're a failure. Nobody likes you. It, it's a demonic prophecy that is spoken over you again and again and again. And when the church doesn't talk and parents don't talk, people die. When the enemy opens his mouth, we need to open ours. We need to put a word against a word. Come on, somebody say amen. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You can't just think love in your heart. You've got to prophesy it over your children. You can't just think good things about your children. You have to speak it over them. The Bible says, when you pray, say. You have to open up your mouth. That's why the Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. You have to learn to prophesy it over your marriage, over your husband, over your wife, over your children. Life and death is in the power of your tongue. And when we prophesy these things over our children, nothing shapes your children's identity more than prophecy. Nothing will shape their identity more than prophecy. Just let somebody prophesy over you, you're gonna be a missionary, and watch how you don't start Googling missions trips. Looking at missions, why? Because they spoke a word over your life. That's, that's the same thing. When Satan speaks a demonic word or he speaks through a person to speak a demonic word over your family, over your marriage, over your children, it starts to shape. That's why you have to, you have to plead the blood of Jesus. I know it's old fashioned, but I still believe in pleading the blood of Jesus. And, and learn how to hand a generational blessing to your children instead of a generational curse. Divorce ran in your family. Hatred ran in your family. Bitterness ran in your family until it ran into me. Divorce ran in my family until it ran into me. Sleeping around with people ran in my family until it ran into me. Having babies with multiple women ran in my family until it ran into me. And when it ran into me, it stopped. And I refused to hand down to another generation a generational curse. I'm going to hand down. I feel like throwing my shoe out in the crowd. I'm going to hand down a generational blessing. I will bless my children. It stops with me. Alcoholism stops with me. Abuse stops with me. Addiction stops with me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I, I am going to prophesy a new bloodline upon some of you in the name of Jesus. Alcoholism ran in your bloodline. Divorce ran in your bloodline. Hatred and addiction ran in your bloodline. But I plead the blood of Jesus over you today and I prophesy a new bloodline. I know it's old fashioned, but what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. There's power, power, wonder, work power in the precious blood of Jesus. Why are you yelling? Because that's what I do. And realizing how to have biblical love. Biblical love is not an, an, an emotion. Biblical love is a decision. That no, no matter what I go through, no matter what, what happens, I'm coming home every night. That I made a, a covenant between my spouse and the Lord in a threefold cord is not easily broken. That as for me and my house, we're going to put God first. As for me and my house, we're going to honor God's house. I watch people say, well, we're not going to church. We're going to have family time. Is it really family time? Or is mom watching TV, dad's on the iPad, and the kids are on their devices? You may have more family time riding to church as a family, sitting at to, in church as a family, worshiping as a family, serving as a family, going out to lunch afterwards as a family, talking about the word of God as a family, driving home together as a family. Some of us, our most family time is when we are in God's house. Especially when the Mayo Clinic says the average family spends 90 seconds together a day. I'm not talking about in the same roof. I'm talking about in a room, together, not on devices. Together is about 90 seconds together a day. We all go out to lunch. We're all on our devices. We're alone together. And we've got to make a decision to get involved. 
We can no longer afford to be lazy parents. We can no longer afford to be lazy husbands. We can no longer afford to be lazy wives. My wife and I were talking the other day about how we live in a world where everybody has just outsourced parenting. You teach them how to do sports. You teach them how to read and write. You teach them, they want the church to teach them how to pray and the church, the church to teach them about. We're not even called as a church to do kids' ministry. We do it. This church does amazing at kids' ministry. But God taught us to teach the parents and bless the children. Now they want us to bless the adults and teach the children. If you got kids, you in kids' ministry. Come on. We, we cannot outsource this. We have to get involved in teaching our children the word of God. We have to learn to turn the doggone TV off. Turn it off and invest into our children and realize that God owns the night, that God is not going to waste one third of our life, that God wants to speak to us while we sleep, that we should turn off the hate news. Let's turn off all of these horror films. Let's turn off all of the Netflix and all that kind of stuff. And let's spend the last 30 minutes as a family focusing on God. I promise you, you'd have better mornings if you had better nights and God owns the night. God wants to speak to you while you sleep. The Bible says that he giveth to his beloved even while they they rest. That, that, That God's first language is not English. That God's not American. So we're like, what? Like, I love America, but God's not American. He's a king. And, and God's first language is not English. God's first language is visions and dreams. Only like two people in the Bible God spoke to audibly. Everybody else God spoke to in the Bible who spoke to in visions and dreams. That's why you confuse your children when you ask them what is God saying to them and they're listening for English and they go, I don't hear God, God doesn't speak to me because God's first language is not English. God's first language is visions and dreams. So if we don't prepare our families to hear visions and dreams, if we don't prepare our families to get visions and dreams and set our mind on God before we go to rest, because for some of us, that's the only time we shut up long enough for God to speak to us is when we're asleep. It's the only time we calm down enough for God to speak to us and God will speak to you in visions and dreams. To all of us in here, all of you who are are single, it's so important, listen to me, let me help you with this because we live in a world where people operate in feelings. Most people I talk to, they they even start most of their sentences with the word feelings. You see, if, if you could get a vision and a dream of your spouse, you wouldn't have to feel So if you're single, you need to go to God and say, God, begin to show me in a vision and dream what my spouse looks like. Show me what they're doing. Show me what we'll be doing together in the future so that when I meet them, I'll know it's them because I saw them in a vision or a dream. If you don't get a vision and a dream, then you just start dating the dozens And you start operating like, I don't know, I feel like he's maybe the right guy. I feel like she's maybe the right girl. And that's why it takes you so long to date. If if all the lights were to cut out in here right now, and I said, I need you guys to leave, uh, leave the room, you know how you would leave the room? Through feeling. There's a chair here somewhere, I saw it. I thought it was a chair. Yeah, this feels like the chair. This is the wall, here's the wall. I feel like this is the wall, and you would go really slow. It would take you 10 times longer to get out of here than with the lights on and you could see. That's why the Bible says, write the vision, make it plain, that all that see may run. When you can see, you can run, but when you can't see, you gotta feel. And that's why you're dating five, seven, eight years, because you're feeling, oh, Jesus. You, you don't trust. How many of you ever picked up something in the dark and you thought it was something only when the lights turned on to realize it was something else? And that's why you're trying to feel your way through the, the dating. You're trying to feel your way. Is this the right business? Should I take this? Do I feel like this is the right job? Do I feel? Do I feel? Do I feel? And just be cautious of yourself when you use the word feelings. It may be because there's areas of your life that you can't see. Because you've not asked God to give you a vision or a dream. Same thing for your children. We live in a world where people just go, I'm going to make a bunch of money so my kids can do whatever they want to do. But God didn't tell us to do that. Most of us were raised and your parents said, you can be whatever you want. Just do whatever you want. Just, just do whatever you want to do. You can be, be whatever you want. But the Bible says train up children in the way they should go. How do you know how to train them in the way they should go if you don't have a vision or a dream of the way they should go? And because you don't have a vision of the way they should go, you tell them just do whatever you want. 
You've got to go to God and say, God, show me in a vision or dream my children doing something. Show me the plan that you have for their life so I can start to lean them in that direction. That's why they're doing all these kind of things. You know, oh, they're playing this sport or doing that and instrument. And I'm, I'm fine with all of that. But when my wife and I looked at that, you know, the odds of your kid. I just bought a saxophone for, my, for one of my kids. It was like 2000 something dollars for a saxophone. And the odds of him being Kenny G are 0.005%. The odds of our kids taking any uh, extracurricular activity into adulthood as a profession, sports, the NFL, NBA, karate, dance, that they're gonna become a professional dancer, any of that kind of stuff is 0.005%. And we run them all over God's creation, spend all kinds of money every year. And we'll say no to youth ministry, no to church, no to this, no to all these kind of things. I went in our kids ministry the other week at church. I went in there and told the parents, I said, look, all our kids ain't going in the NBA. I went in there. I looked. I saw the kids that are in there. They ain't going in the NFL. I saw them. I looked in there. All of them, they ain't all going to make it, but they can all go to heaven. They can all have a call of God on their life. They can all serve God. They can all be somebody in Jesus Christ. Come on, parents. Amen. We can no longer afford to outsource this stuff. Godly parents cannot afford to be lazy parents. Stay-at-home parents don't produce church-going kids. At some point, we've got to make a decision to pray with our children and teach them how to prophesy over each other. It will cut down on sibling rivalry when your children prophesy blessings over each other. I just prophesy you're going to be successful. I prophesy you're going to be a multimillionaire. I prophesy that God's going to use you and you're going to heal people all around the world. I prophesy it cuts down on sibling rivalry when you grow up speaking blessings over your sibling and not curses. You're annoying. You get on my nerves. You all, all, all of that kind of stuff. We've got to learn to change our speech. And if you want to know what you sound like, listen at your children. If you want to know what you pray like, ask your kids to pray. Oh, Jesus, am I helping somebody in here? See, children are terrible, the worst, at doing what you ask them to do. They're awful at it. That's why all day you're like, didn't I tell you to do this? How many times do I have to tell you? If I have to tell you to do this one more time, I'm going to lose my mind. Didn't your father tell you? Didn't your mother tell you? Didn't we say this to you? They're awful at doing what we ask them to do, but they're amazing at doing what they see you do. They will do what, what they see you do without you asking. They will talk like you without you asking them to talk like you. That's why we have to learn how to model a godly relationship with our children. Because, you see, if if your children only see you pray on Sunday, if they only see you worship on Sunday, they will grow up and believe you are religious. And the best place to raise an atheist is a religious home. If you want to raise an atheist, be religious. But when they see that it is a genuine relationship, see, for me, my parents grew up and, 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 and it wasn't religious because I would wake up in the middle of the night and my mama would be next to my bed crying and praying in the Holy Ghost because I had lost my mind at 13. I would walk in the house sometimes and just see my parents worshiping, see them praying, crying out to God. And I knew that this wasn't something that they just practiced on Sunday. This wasn't something that they did just to let people see them or, or to put on a show. This was something that they believed in their heart. And it taught me about a genuine relationship with God. We cannot afford to to, to outsource parenting. We cannot afford to outsource our walk with God. This has to be something that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you're here and you're single, raise the value you place on yourself. Even though other people are getting married, you know, anybody can get married. The, The question is, can they stay married? Yeah, yeah, she got married. My friend got married and they got married. Yeah, but are they going to stay married? And I know, I know that you may feel like God forgot about you and you're like that piece of luggage on the baggage claim that nobody wants to claim and it's just going around and around and around and you feel like nobody wants to marry me and nobody, you know, God doesn't have anybody for me and you go to family reunions and, you know, and your, your cousin just got married and, you know, your, your aunt's like, you're next and it doesn't make you feel any better. Just tell her at the next funeral, you're next. I'm just kidding. Don't say that. Don't say that. But, but just learn to wait on God 
Realize that God has a plan for your life. We live in a world where people, you know, they just want to, they want to do whatever they want to do, however they want to do it. They don't want to follow God's plan for marriage. God has a plan for marriage. God has a plan for dating. That's why my wife and I are so intentional. Do not get in a dating relationship until you're ready for marriage. Because when passion has no place to go, it perverts. Do not let your teenagers get in a dating relationship. They're 13. I watch parents driving 13-year-olds and 15-year-olds. See, God made love to stick and God made love to give. For God so loved that he, right? So love is manifested in giving. Don't tell me you love anything you don't give anything to. Don't tell me you love your church, you don't give to your church. Don't tell me you love your kids, you don't give to your kids. Don't tell me you love your, your, your parents, you don't give to your parents. Or love your spouse, you don't give to your spouse. Love is manifested in giving. So if you let a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old fall in love, they're going to give. But they don't have anything to give. If you cannot give a ring and give a date and give a wedding and give a home, you're going to give all you have, which is your body. Because love makes you give. They don't have anything to give. I have teenagers. Teenagers are homeless people. I have two in my home. I have, I told them, I said, you're a homeless person that I let live in my home. You're, you're homeless. You don't have a home. We let you live here for free as a blessing of generosity. But you're a homeless person. You can't date anybody. You have nothing to give. When some guy one day comes to me and my wife and says, I want to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage, our response is we need you to write an explicit detail, a paper. I need you to write a full-fledged paper, an explicit detail, explaining to her mother and I why she is better off with you than us. Why is she better off with you than us? Because it's not about money, because we can provide for her. I can do more for her than you. It's not that she doesn't get love and affection. Why, you need to explain to us why is she better off with you than with us. That's why you cannot just let them get into a relationship. The Bible says do not awaken love until the appropriate time, because once you awaken it, it don't go back to sleep. Do not awaken love. It's like if this was a picture and I was going to hang this picture on the wall, I would look back at you guys and I, and I would go, is it straight? And the reason I would ask you if it's straight is because I'm too close. I can't tell if it's straight because I'm too close. And if you sleep with him before you get married, now, now it's like this. This is exactly what I wanted. This is everything I've been dreaming for. You know, this is, I've been praying for this. And your mom's like, baby, it's upside down. You just don't want me to be happy. You're trying to ruin my life. You're trying to control me. Nobody's trying to control you. You're too close. We're telling you it's not even a picture. <laughs> and one of the reasons he will not ask you to marry him if, 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 if you've gone, if you've brought it in too close is because now he is not sure if it's lining up properly. And that's why you stay in this dating intimate relationship for years and he won't ask you to marry him because he's not sure it's lining up because he's too close and he can't tell. You had already had a ring on your finger if you'd have stayed further away because he would have been able to see it's lining up properly and make the commitment. Oh, Jesus. Help me, Lord. You don't want to get unequally yoked to somebody because marriage is work. Let all the married people say amen. It's work. It's work. I look at people, we want to get married. We want to get, get married. Go on. Go on. See how much fun it is. Go on. We want to have children. We just love children. We want to have children. Have them. Have them. Go on. Have them. Enjoy it. Enjoy going to restaurants and people urinating in their clothes and spilling things on themselves. See how much fun it is. Having blowouts on the way to church. You got to turn around and go back. All the parents know what I'm talking about. Go on, have them. Cereal bowls in the closet, hot dogs shoved down in between the seats in the rear seat of the car, chicken nuggets under the floorboard. Have them. (laughs) 
but realizing that God has a plan and he has order. He has a way of doing things. And what happens is we, we get, let's do it like this. Let me use this illustration. We mess up when we change the order. I had him bring this out here for anybody know how to make spaghetti. Come on. Anybody in here knows how to make anybody and in the campuses, you know how to make. So you got to have the pasta. You got to have some meatballs. You know, you got to do meatballs and you got to have um, spaghetti sauce. You got to do it, you know. You got to have some spaghetti sauce here. And um, cheese. Come on, you got to have some cheese. And so all you do to make spaghetti um, is you put the pasta in and, and then sauce. You got to put the sauce. You got, that's an ingredient you got to have, you know. And then in order to handle the noodles, you got to soften them up. They need water. And then um, uh, meatballs, is, they are awesome. They're a reminder of how much God loves us. And then um, cheese, you gotta put on some cheese. A little more cheese. And so you have all the ingredients, you know? We got it in, the meatballs, I'm sexy. You know, she's sexy, everybody's sexy. We're young, we're having a good time. We got all the ingredients that we need for a healthy relationship, and, and that's all you do to make spaghetti. <laughs> there it is, meatballs, cheese, noodles, pasta. We got, it's served. And this is how a lot of people do relationships. They just go, we got all the same ingredients everybody else has. Yeah, but you, there's, you change the order. You change the steps. It's not about, did you meet a guy? And did you meet a girl? And oh, we're in love. And uh, oh, we both want to be successful. You, you change the order. You, you, you move into intimacy before following the steps that God has. And, and I want to tell you, you can put the same ingredients, but it's not going to taste the same. It's not going to taste the same. See, like for me, I'm, I'm a cook, okay? Like I'm a cook. I'm not a chef. I'm a cook. Like a cook can take ingredients and make something out of it. Like I'm a cook. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like big mama, cousin Isabel, like I'll hurt you. You won't fit in nothing when I'm through with you. Like, like I, it's like, I'm, I'm a cook. I'll just find ingredients and I'll put it together and it'll be Sunday surprise. You know, it, it'll be, it'll be some kind of thing, but God is not a cook. God is a chef. God is intentional about the ingredients, where they come from, when they come how you add it, when you add it, how much you add to it. God is a chef and God is saying, well, you, you just threw the ingredients there. Don't get mad at me because it don't taste like what I told you it was going to taste like because you just brought ingredients when you wanted to do it, how you wanted to do it. And now you mad at me because the relationship don't taste like what you wanted it to taste like. You got to learn to follow God's steps and follow the plans that he has for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. It's about, it's about values, not just vision. I watch people all the time. Oh, he wants to be successful. I want to be successful. Let's get married. Oh, he wants to have family. I want to have family. Same vision. Let's get married. No, it, you, people don't divorce over vision. They divorce over values. Vision is what we want to do. Values are how we want to do it. It's not that we don't both want to be successful. We don't agree on how we're going to do it. He wants to work 80 hours. She wants to work 30. That's a difference. You've got to learn to sit down and talk about the values. Your, your, your church has values. Some of you, the clothing you're wearing on, the brand, that, the company has values. The company you work for, it probably has values. How can you not have family values? How have you never sat down as a relationship and put together the values for your home? My wife and I sat down and we put together values. One of our family values is God speaks to me no matter my age. Another one is we will do nothing consistently that consistently takes us away from God's house. So when my kids come to me and says, I want to play soccer, we can't be in church for 12 weeks. No, we're not going to do that because we're not going to do anything consistently that consistently takes us away from God's house. That's a family value. If you don't sit down and figure out your family values then you'll be making decisions based on just opportunities and how things come and who wants to do this and who wants to do that. And you have to learn how to manage your expectations. And if you don't manage your expectations, you will manage your disappointments. The disappointment is the difference or the distance between where you are and where you want to be. And the bigger that is, the bigger your disappointment. 
But if you learn to manage your expectations and say, these are my expectations for our home. We're going to pray together every night. We're going to pray as a family. We're going to pray as a marriage. I'm telling you, one of the greatest things, I know it sounds simple, one of the greatest things you can do for your marriage is simply pray together daily. Pray together daily. Prophesy blessings over your husband. Prophesy blessings over your wife, over your children. And I get it, parents. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's amazing. Sometimes it feels awesome. And sometimes it's like, guys, quit passing gas. We're trying to pray here. I mean, I have kids. Sometimes it's awesome. Sometimes it's not. You have to learn how to manage it. There's going to be ups. There's going to be downs. You're going to have good days. There's going to be bad days. Put systems in place. Parenting at 43 is different from parenting at at, at 28 Having, having one-year-olds at 43, you know, because when you're 28, you get on the ground and play with them, wrestle with them. At 43, you're like, hey, <laughs> daddy loves y'all. <laughs> seasons, somebody say seasons. But if you're here and you're single, I'll get ready to leave you with this. You know, what, how do I know he's the right guy? How do I know that this is the right person? You know, to all the, the single ladies that are in here, you know, if you get ready to get in a relationship with a guy, the very first place that you should meet him is in the presence of God. A man needs to be in God's presence. God formed Adam and he was in his presence. His presence. Don't go into the club and find a guy and try and drag him now into the presence. I watch the little girls do it all the time. We're going to drag him. You come into this church. You don't want to do that. Is he working? Can he cultivate you? Can he improve your life? Can he protect you? Can he teach you the word of God? Does he have a relationship with God? You know, when the Bible says, the Bible doesn't say it's not good for man to be alone. It says it's not good for this man to be alone. Well, what kind of man? A man that's in the presence of God. A man that can cultivate you. A man that's prepared to teach you the word of God. A man that is working. A man that can protect you. That man should not be alone. So what is the Bible saying? Well, if this guy's not in the presence of God, if he doesn't know the word of God, if he can't protect you, he's not working, he can't cultivate you, then it is good for that man to be alone. Because he's got to get where he needs to be before God brings him Eve. I'm telling you guys, God's got a way of doing it. God has a dating service that's better than any app you could find. It's called the Holy Ghost. And he will bring the right person into your life at the right time. I wish I had single people who really believe this. I'm telling you, God will bring the right person into your life at the right time. It's like Boaz. God brought, God brought, the, the, them together at the right time. She didn't have to run around and do that. God literally brought the right person into her life at the right time. You know what the Bible says about Boaz? It, it says he was a handsome man. Come on, ladies. It says he was a rich man. It's pretty good. He was a spiritual man. I mean, you want a spiritual man, right? He was a sensitive man. Come on, ladies. Don't leave me out here by myself. How many of you want a sensitive man? That equals a husband. (laughs) And you have to learn to wait on your Boaz. And if you don't wait on your Boaz, you're going to end up in trouble. You're going to end up just running after this person or running after that person. And I'm telling you what, I'd much rather wait on the right person than do it two, three, four times. Because what happens, we live in a world now where people practice divorce. They practice getting in relationships and breaking up, getting in relationships and breaking up. And now, before you get married, you've practiced divorce 20, 30 times. And what happens is you play like you practice. And practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. God made love to be eternal. He made love to be everlasting. Wait on your Boaz. Everybody say, wait on your Boaz. Wait on your Boaz. And, and if, you, if you do, you know, God will bring a whole person into your life. You won't be attracting all these half of people. All the wrong people into your life. Wait on your Boaz. And when you can have that confidence in God 
in the Holy Spirit, knowing that God is bringing the right person, then I don't have to like walk away from God's house. I don't have to walk away from church. I don't have to get in this place where I don't listen to my parents and I'm uncoachable. Let your parents coach you. If you're here and you're single, you're a young adult, you're a teenager, one of the greatest things you could do in your life is give your parents permission to correct you. Give them permission to correct you. If you're here and you're married, one of the greatest blessings you can do is give your spouse permission to correct you. Just say, I give you permission to correct me. God speaks to me a lot, and a lot of times it sounds like my wife. A lot. And I've had to learn, like God is speaking to me. And I'm like, I don't wanna hear this, but God is speaking to me. Wait on your Boaz. Because if you don't, I'll leave you with this, Boaz has some relatives. And if you're not careful, you won't get the one God has for you. You'll get his relatives. They're gonna put some of them on the screen here for me. If you don't, you'll end up with uh, broke ass, po ass, lying ass, cheating ass, dumb ass, drunk ass, cheap ass, locked up ass, good for nothing ass, lazy ass, and especially his third cousin beating your ass. Wait on your Boaz so he respects your ass. Somebody say amen today. Come on, you get something out of this. Come on, let's give God a praise all over the house, all the campuses. Wait on God. Come on, stand with me. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this amazing church. I thank you for the plan and the prophecy that you have for them. I thank you for every marriage, Lord, that's represented in this house, every single person that's represented. God, I pray that every single person would raise the value they place on themselves. Lord, that they would lean into your voice, that we would all get a prophetic word for our children, our spouse, and our future. Lord, I thank you that the best days of our life are in front of us. That when we leave here today and we get in our car, there's a great big windshield and a little bitty rear view mirror because where we're going is more important than where we've been. We can't do anything about where we've been, but we can do something today about where we're going. I thank you that the best days of our life, God, are in front of us. The vision is in front of us. Let us run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. And I thank you for what you're about to do at Elevate Life, in Jesus' name. Somebody, anybody, everybody say. Come on, give God a big praise all over the house. We love you, God bless you.